right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the live stream. I got Johnny Winters here with us. Uh, so excited. We're going to be talking about uh, Lake House and, and all the, all what the heck it is, how you can use it, all that great stuff. Hey, Johnny, welcome to the show. Hey, Chris. How's it going? Uh, I'm doing so, so good. Um, Thank you so much for taking time to out of your day to come and join us. Uh, you want to tell everyone if, who, who might not know you wh where you're from, where you're at, what you know, what you're doing? Yeah, no worries. So uh, my name is Johnny Winter. Uh, people of the internet might know me from uh, Grace School Analytics. That's what this logo here is. Uh, so Grace School Analytics is my website. Um, I've got a YouTube channel as well. Uh, I do mostly nerding about Power BI um, is effectively what that... Um, what that website is all about so there's a blog there and and, and what have you um it's just a hobby so some people think that grace analytics is my full-time job it absolutely isn't um my full-time job is actually i work for a company called advancing analytics so advanced analytics is a consultancy uh we specialize in data engineering and data science um i recently joined as their analytics specialist which effectively is code word for being their power bi nerd as well so yeah I, my preference is nerding out about power bi advancing analytics actually we specialize in the lake house so i've kind of come on board to start building uh, analytics on top of lake houses which i guess is why sort of i feel almost qualified to talk about this particular subject. Um, the other thing as well is the guys at work were telling me off the other day, saying that I put myself down as being just the Power BI guy. Um, I've actually worked in data for like over 15 years and I've done data warehousing, I've done semantic layers, I've done, you know, I've done the whole stack. I just tend to only talk about Power BI because it's the bit that I, in, I enjoy the most. But yeah, that's me. Oh, that's fantastic. Well. Uh, excited to, to have you here, and I've got links that I'm posting to all of your stuff inside the chat as well. So, uh, people, you, please make sure you connect with, with Johnny Winters or Grayskull Analytics over on YouTube. Like, subscribe to his stuff. Uh, it, I'm sure he'd really appreciate that. And also, are, are you on uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, any of those places uh, a favorite of yours? Yeah, so I'm all over Twitter. So that's at Grey School PBI. Um, I do LinkedIn as well. So my LinkedIn at the moment has been a, uh, a subject of much uh, amusement for a lot of people. I've been, uh, I did LinkedIn hard mode. So I did a LinkedIn post every day. And some of it might have been a bit weak. Um, but it was fun doing it anyway. So yeah, I try and keep a bit of a presence on LinkedIn. More fun oh, stuff on Twitter. <laughs> fantastic. And I, I think I saw your post today. Was that on um, uh, data pairs? So uh, Data Pairs, Mara Pereira's website, uh, I did a post on yesterday. Uh, today was um, a blog that Ed Hansbury did about calculated oh. columns. We could talk about calculated columns all day. <laughs> well, uh, all, all right. Well, I would love to talk calculated columns. Um, that's something I have a, a, a particular view on, but... That is a completely another uh, topic for another day. So uh, before we get into any of that, um, I do want to let all the viewers know, hey, we are here, you know, because number one, because I wanted to talk to Johnny, but we're doing this uh, on a live stream because we want to help you educate your knowledge, follow further your uh, understanding of what the heck this lake house thing is. So if you have any questions for, for Johnny or myself, put those down into the, the uh, chat, put a Q colon mark on the front of it so that it, you know, we, under, we see that it's a question for us to ask and answer, and we'll do our best to get to all of the questions on the chat. No promises, no guarantees, uh, um, but we'll do what we, we can on this. Um, so before we get into any of that, I'm gonna ask us, you know, this is our, our lunch and learn, so uh, let's raise our glass. Uh, combine glasses and you know, be a, your waters, your uh, protein meals, your your coffees, your beers, your carbonated beverage of choice, and let's just take a sip before we get up and going. Mm. All right, awesome. Okay, Johnny. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Johnny, let's. Uh, Oh my, uh, let's go in and see, can you explain to us what the heck is a data lake house? 
Yeah, what is it? So I guess there's lots of misconceptions about what it potentially is or it isn't. So first thing that I sort of talk about is whether or not, is it just a buzzword? Is it just marketing hype? So how, uh, if you don't mind me asking, Chris, how long have you been working in data? Uh, for about 20 years. Yeah, okay. So I'm um, 15, 16 years now. And I would say throughout that career, I've seen so many buzzwords come and go around data. Have you, can you think of any off the top of your head? Oh, there was data fabric was trendy for a while. Well, it's, it's, still, done it's not. We're not you calling it data fabric anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, data mesh is doing the rounds at the moment. I know there's yep. a lot of hype about that. Uh, and a lot of people just think that a lake house is the same thing. It's just marketing hype. And I guess um, data bricks, who are the company who claim to have come up with the phrase, definitely just really played on the marketing at first. So they did a really, really aggressive marketing campaign like about 18 months ago. And it was all things like the data warehouse is dead. Um, I was really triggered by it because I don't think data warehouses are dead at all. Uh, but they were saying, no, nope, this is the data warehouse killer. We're getting rid of it. And they did a campaign on Valentine's Day where they um, wrote a breakup letter to data warehouses. Um, so they were really aggressive. And it just, again, it just felt like marketing hype. Um, They've since kind of cooled their stance now, really. So they're actually now talking about the fact that the lake house is the best way to do a data warehouse. Um, and it feels that potentially that kind of initial sort of bow wave of, of hype around it is sort of getting to the point now. So I think Gartner do their hype curve. And if you look at data lake house on that, kind of it feels at the point now where it's, it, it really is starting to gain traction in it and it feels like it's... Um, you know, it's going to be here to stay effectively. So I don't think it is just a buzzword. I think it's a, a valid um, data architecture that's that's here to stay. And, you know, I think we're in it for the long run. Um, well, all the misconceptions that come. Hang on. And, and I'd like to get into understanding why do you think it's going to be here for the long run? What aspects of it do you think are going to be here beyond just a flash in a pan? Because I think you're exactly right. When people talk about data mesh or big data, you know, th those terms are, are great because they're short, they're concise, executives can remember them to ask the people that they don't know what questions to ask about, you know, they can ask on those. Uh, so so why do you think uh, data, you know, um, uh, data lake house is going to be here to stay? So I guess I've been working with Lake House for 18 months-ish at the moment. So I've been with Advanced Analytics since last September, but then the consultancy I worked for before that was doing Lake House implementations as well. And I guess just from experiencing it and, and gone through a few implementations, it feels to me like it's the almost natural evolution of, of where we've been going in the data world. So that's... Yeah, I think all the rationale for it, all the reasons for it, all the advantages and the recognized disadvantages, you know, it's not necessarily the, I don't think the message should be everybody should go out there and everybody should have a lake house now. But I think for the, the right people, um, it is the right choice. And more and more, it's the right choice for more and more people as well. Um, I, I'm yeah. going to toss out a controversial statement. I think a data lake house architecture is the right choice if you have more than a hundred employees. I, okay. I, I don't think cool. there's, I, I don't think there's a, another or better pattern that you should be adopting. I think the lake house is an incredible uh, pattern. And that's why I, I really want us to talk about this because if you're going to say, what's the size of an organization that runs a data lake house today, Johnny, what, what would your random guess be? Is it a small hundred person shop or, or is it, or no? Personally, this is personal experience, both, any, and I'm 100% happy to, to get to that in terms of um, why I think why I think that is 100%. We can go for it now if you like. We might be we might be preempting some of the. Oh, I might minutes. jump in the head. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep the keep the conversation going. Let's come let's come back to it. Let's put All a pin right. in that, and then like <laughs> like definitely let's get back to like yeah, because because it it's a good it's a good point of debate, and definitely I don't think that. I don't think there's necessarily one right answer. So yeah, it'd definitely be good to get your opinions on it on it as well, 100%. Sure. Um, so where was I? Oh, okay, cool. Other misconceptions about what a lake house is. I have quite good fun with people on Twitter and LinkedIn who when somebody mentions a lake house, they think all they, all they hear is data lake. They don't hear the house bit. 
And then they come up with all these objections about why data lake houses are rubbish. But all they've come up with is actually all the arguments against lakes, not lake houses. And a lake house is a different thing. It's not the same. It's different. Um, again, I'll try and I'm, I've got a uh, a few slides a bit later on just to give us like a brief history of the data platform. And I'll hopefully sort of try and call out some of those differences as well. But yeah, a lake house isn't a lake. And definitely some of the arguments that people give against lake house, they've just got the wrong end of the stick because it's it, it's, a, it's a different thing. Right, um, and I, I think that's uh, that's very important because what we're talking about here is you know the the best of both worlds, right? Your your chocolate and your peanut butter together as Reese's pieces or peanut butter cups, and not just chocolate or peanut butter, right? I love that analogy, Chris. One of my main clients at the minute is actually Hershey, so I'm in I'm in chocolate and peanut butter analytics all day. Um, but yeah, hundred <laughs> percent, absolutely. Awesome. Um, yeah, definitely. It, yeah, it's a different thing, and and yeah, I'll, I'll I'll come to that hopefully and show some of that off. So, I guess the other misconception is that this isn't one specific technology. There isn't like one person that sells lake houses. It isn't just one piece of tech. Um, again, I personally, with advanced analytics, probably most of the time work with Databricks. Um, we do a little bit with uh, Synapse as well. Most of the time, this is still all Azure based. We're, we're Microsoft partners, so it tends to be in Azure. But most of the time, we're, we're using Databricks. Quite a few projects mix and match. So we'll have some components of our lake house that we'll do in Databricks, and other parts we'll do in Synapse. Um, from a Synapse perspective, I can't decide how to say Synapse or Synapse. I'm going to go with Synapse. Um, yeah, some will mix and match. Definitely, Microsoft are now pushing more and more. Um, they're catching up to Databricks in terms of um, where the platform's at, in terms of being able to implement that as well. But there's other vendors too. There's, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about one of the enablers for Lake House's um, storage formats, the file formats that we use. There's actually different um, vendors and different formats out there that we can use as well. So this isn't a, a one technology stop. This isn't a, you go out and sign a check for Oracle to sell you a lake house. It's very much a conceptual architecture. It can bring in different components from different vendors. You might want to, you might store your data. It, I mean, this would be a bad idea for, for starters, but you might want to store your data in Google Cloud Storage. And then you might want to ingest your data using uh, Amazon Glue. And then you might want to use Dremio for your um, compute engine to query your lake house. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big architecture. It's not just you go out and buy a product off the shelf and there's your lake house sorted. So that's, I guess, the other misconception that I'd probably want to address. Well, and, and to that point, I, I think what we're talking about here is we're really talking about an architecture and a a structure that is universal in nature, right? In the in the same way, like oh, there's open source, there's open source file types. Um, this is something that is very, you know, the tech is open, right? The, the, you know, there's no one technology that gives you a CSV, right? There's, you know, the, you know, many tech pieces of tech that do that. So there's many pieces of technology that can help build and breed a data lake house, which could even lead, and, and maybe it's not each of the, you know, different platforms does a different piece of it, but maybe you're in a large organization where you have a multi-cloud strategy and you have teams that are in, in Azure, you have teams that are in AWS, and you have teams that are in Google. And uh, they're very large organizations and they can do their work in each of those each of those areas and you can do a sync between them all, right? So there's ways that you can make that work broadly because it's just a pattern, right? 100%. One of the other advantage of it absolutely is this kind of idea of plug and play as well. The fact that actually you can take that architecture and mm -hmm. any one component, you could theoretically just replace relatively easily. Um, you know, so if I, if I decided that, <laughs> okay, this is going to show my age, uh, back when I started my days as a, an analyst, it was all in Oracle using PLSQL. Um, and then as my kind of career evolved, uh, I moved over to using the Microsoft platform and, and T SQL. I always, Think, I think I prefer T SQL. Let's be honest. I always enjoyed working with T SQL. There always seems to be more resources out there for people to be able to use it. If, for argument's sake, I had all my data in Oracle, but I said actually T SQL is a better thing to use, I'd have to move all of my data out of Oracle into 
SQL Server in order for me to be able to use T-SQL. Now, one of the things with Lakehouse is you've got this idea of separating storage and compute. So you can store your data in one place and then plug in your compute and, and change your mind. So again, I've worked on uh, projects where we might have started out using, uh, we've stored our data in a, in, in a data lake, it's still called a data lake. Um, we tend to do that using um, Azure, uh, Azure Data Lake. And then we might have started out where we've used uh, Databricks as the compute engine for querying it. And then we've decided, oh, actually, we want to uh, leverage some of the advantages of using uh, Synapse Serverless instead. So actually, we've changed our mind. doesn't matter. We'll switch that off. We'll switch this on. We're up and running. Yeah, and I, I think that is the brilliant piece of it is because it's just a standard file format and a pattern, you can use many tools on top of it. And when... You know, okay, hey, Databricks has been best in class for a while. Use that. When all of a sudden you have a, a solution or a need to use Synapse Serverless, you use that, right? Uh, I just, I love it. And, and and maybe you've got a slide up. Let's maybe we should go. Over. And this is something I think would be very helpful for people to go over the brief history of data platforms that you have. Yeah, go for it. Are we are we up and running? Can everyone, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Classic. <laughs> uh, yeah, so kind of almost the evolution of uh, data platforms. So this is where my data career started. I don't know about, uh, about you, Chris, but I was all on-premise. Uh, my first day data warehouses were on-premise SQL Server. We'd use uh, integration services to ingest our data. We'd put that into staging tables in our data warehouse. And then we'd load from our staging tables into our warehouse, and that is what we would use for our BI and analytics. So this pattern has been around for 30, I mean, my data career is 15 years, but this was the de facto approach when I started. And it had been around for 10, 15 years, if not longer before that. So I think most data warehouse professionals would probably recognize the data warehouse. Yeah. I'm going to have this as our starting point for data platforms. So I, I, I will say that this picture right here, you're right, has been around for 30 years or so. Uh, and it's also why I think it's so silly for companies to say that they're no longer doing ETL, but they're doing ELT. Like liars, this is this is something this is not something new. This is something we've been doing for 30 years. You just decided to like swap the two names out and then, oh, we're we're only doing views on top of it. Okay. That works until you have performance issues. Uh, but that's a whole religious rant I have against uh, E uh, L T versus E T L. Yeah. So this is. I mean, this goes back to this goes back to the marketing buzzwords, doesn't it? And E L T yep. is a great example of it. I'm in the same boat as you. It's still just E T L. Yeah. Just they're just kind of trying to claim that the order is a bit different. Um, yeah. Let's not start on reverse E T L because that will trigger <laughs> me even more. And then have you come across have you come across the, the newest one? No. Zero E T L. Oh come on! Zero Who's doing ETL? that? <laughs> What marketing Zero person ETL. out there? Uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I want to talk to you. Zero ETL in your buzzwords. Ugh. All right. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. No problem. So this is the starting point anyway. So kind of next up here, I've got the data lake. And again, from my career as a data professional, I got myself feet under the table doing data warehouse, and I was pretty comfortable. And then everything blew up in terms of big data, big data, big data everywhere. And it always wound me up because data is just data. Surely data is just data. Um, I get the whole variety and velocity thing, but the big thing really, really used to wind me up. But everyone was like, oh, well, you need to do everything on a, on a, on a data lake. And this is what the data lake looked like. So rather than storing data in the in a database and structuring it into something like a dimensional model, we just throw it all in the lake. We'll do schema on read. Rather than designing our schema once and using it lots and lots of times, Every time we want to query the data, we'll do the schema at, at that point. And I, surely that's just lots, that just sounds like too much effort to me. Why, why, why not just, just define it once and use it lots of times? But schema on read was all the buzz. Lakehouse was a new great thing. Um, people would store their files in the Lakehouse and they'd store more files. And it was like, well, storage is cheap. We can We can store everything. And before you know it, Right, the classic, the cheesy line here is the data lake turned into a, a data swamp, but nobody really knows what's going on. Now, again, from my career, like when these first came on the scene, everyone reckoned that you should be doing BI and analytics on a lake as well. I think there's been like opinions have changed over time, and 
more and more people recognize that no it was never really that good for doing bi anyway bi is better having that sort of structured dimensional model but it did have its benefits in terms of things like your machine learning and data science workloads and being able to like use this how you know you still have this idea of separating storage and compute and you could do these like complex data science exper experiments over all of these vast quantities of raw data. So I think there's a few things. I think the whole data lakes turning into data swamps, I think was a an education thing. I think if somebody today were to set up a data lake, they'd actually be a bit cleverer in terms of knowing how to structure it better. And definitely a data lake is still a potentially a good way or a good way to store your data for doing machine learning and data science workloads. So ultimately, if you kind of take the maturity of the data lake and you sort of say that, right, actually, no, we don't really want to use that for BI. We're going to stick with our data warehouse for doing our BI, but we're going to use this concept of a data lake um, for doing the data science. You know, that, that ends up being two different paradigms and two different work streams and two separate architectures that don't really talk to each other, but they're two separate use cases and it kind of works. And they do each have their own oh, hang benefits. On. I, I just a comment yeah. on that, um, uh, to, to your craziness. This <laughs> falls under, I mean, not your the craziness of the data lake, right? So, th this falls under, uh, if you only have a hammer or know how to use a hammer, all of the world is nails, all the world's problems are nails, right? And so, when data lakes first came out, people were super excited about them, and data scientists and they're. We're on the cover of Newsweek, and every, everyone want to be a data scientist. And so they said, "Hey, this is the be all, end all is the data lake." And then all of every CFO on the planet went, "Okay, and balance and certify our books running a schema on read." And uh, you know, they had no asset compliance. They had all sorts of issues with that, and they immediately realized, "Oh, hang on, it's just a hammer, and it's great for data science." But we still need that heavily structured, that heavily auditable, that that asset compliant uh, environment for work that we do, right? So, million, million percent, hundred yeah. percent. So, actually, I don't know, I don't know how many viewers are from the UK, but um, I'm obviously based over here in in, in England, uh, in the north of England, near a town called uh, a city called Manchester. Uh, there's oh. a, a phrase over here. Phrase over here. We talk talk about a a Manchester screwdriver. And a Manchester yeah. screwdriver is a hammer. <laughs> it's, it's like, <laughs> there's a screw, hammer. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, but data warehouses had great benefits. You know, they were, they were structured, they were governed, they were familiar, they were fast for the right types of workload. Um, that sort of structured, we're talking about the fact that we have that well-defined schema from the governance perspective, um, was acid, acid transactions, absolutely, 100%. Um, I've, got a, I've got a slide in the little bit that explains what acid is because people say it all the time yeah acid transactions and i think a lot of people are like okay yeah acid transactions and they don't actually know what it means so i've got a little slide on that that'll explain that as well um familiar because sql's been around forever so people were comfortable with it uh, and yeah for the right workload they were fast whereas data lakes this flexibility with your schema on read so you didn't have to potentially spend all that time designing your pipelines and getting your, your etl in there so you could do things in theory, quicker, um, but from a repeatability perspective, I don't think they necessarily work quite so well. But storage was cheap and also really, really scalable. So you weren't talking about having to, you know, buy new, um, you know, uh, buy another um, uh, blade for your virtual server when you needed to scale out. You know, it was it was all sort of good from that perspective. And again, for some jobs it was good, but for others it wasn't. So I guess like the next stop on the evolution was this concept of the modern data warehouse, which is basically the first attempt to try and marry the two worlds. So people started to organize their data lakes a bit better. And this idea of, well, we'll land all of our raw data into the lake, and then we've got like a, a nice sort of um, audit of what our data look like, and we can keep like a copy for every day, and we'll be able to sort of you know replay that data if we ever need to and we can get it in there quick so that from an experimenting perspective we can do experiments and our data scientists will be will be happy um but then a little bit slower over time we can then port it out of that lake into our structured database and into our data warehouse and then that can serve our bi and analytics load so this was kind of i think the first attempt to try and get these two worlds to meet 
but it was almost kind of I don't know what's the best way to sort of describe it. It was disconnected. It was, yeah, definitely. It was like it was like sort of saying you've got your peanut butter and you've got your chocolate, but actually you were still just eating a I was going to say a Yorkie bar. What's it? What's a, a Hershey bar and a and a jar of Skippy. Yep. It wasn't actually. It wasn't. It wasn't actually a Reese's cup. It was just the fact that you 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 stuck your your chocolate bar and your jar of peanut butter in the same room together and kind of tried to make them be friends. Did you ever um, see those commercials? Uh, this is going to be dating me. Uh, like you got <laughs> you got your chocolate in my peanut butter. No, you got your peanut butter in my chocolate. Well, uh, I got a feeling we're mm-hmm. we're about to have that moment with uh, the history here. So. I'm, Keep going. Yeah, totally. It, it was part of the evolution for me. It got us closer. Um, again, you still have that separation of storage and compute in the lake house area of it. Your warehouse, you were still, you were still tied in to your storage and your compute. You were still going to stick that into a relational database management system. If you're going to use PLSQL, it had to be an Oracle. If you wanted to use T-SQL, it was going to be SQL Server, all that kind of good stuff. And so... Now comes the point where we can talk about what enables the um, the lake house instead, in terms of this idea of the fact that actually part of the reason we part of the reason we couldn't really get the whole that integrated structure is this idea of acid um, acid compliance and acid transactions, and this like lifted from the DataBricks website explains it. So when somebody says to you acid transactions, now you can tell them, oh, you're talking about atomic, atom, I can't say atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. So these are the things. And lakes didn't have this. I only found this out relatively recently because I was I was never really a lake fan anyway. But if a pipeline was running data into a lake and it failed part way through, didn't have any way to know at what point it had failed and whether or not like it should roll you know, roll transactions back or not. In a database, yeah, you have you have that level of governance. So a, um, a transaction fails, it's fine. It just rolls back. And then you can, you know, kick off your ETL um, pipeline again. And, and, you, and you know that your, you know your data is going to be a good place. You're not going to be introducing partial or corrupt data and, you know, all those kind of things into it. Um, and that's good, those, those two separate architectures. The game changer is the new breed of file formats, effectively. So my next slide is talking about the Delta format. So Delta format is um, it's another open source project that uh, Databricks started. Uh, Delta format tends to be the format that you'll see being used in um, a Synapse lake house as well. And this effectively is it's, it's files, it's file formats like a data lake but with ACID compliance, so it can give you that atomicity, consistency, the, the I and the D. Durability, what was the I? It was on my screen a minute ago. I've forgotten it already. Um, yeah, it gives you that. So the way it works is still under the hood. It's still just, uh, it's still parquet files. Isolation. So people talk about, yeah, pe- oh, there we go. People talk about Delta being a file format. It kind of isn't because the file format is still a parquet file but it actually creates a separate set of metadata that sits alongside it that um, has a log so that it can it can basically mm. preserve that, those ACID properties. And the fact that you can now have that, and, and I guess one of the points I wanted okay. to make is that whereas you, you'll probably find that Delta is the one that gets discussed most, there are others out there. So you've got um, Apache Hoodie and you've got Iceberg. So um, people that might have come across... Um, Snowflake as a vendor, Snowflake are all over Iceberg. I don't know if that's because they think it's a better file format or the kind of snow and ice thing just worked for their marketing. Who knows? Uh, Hoodie's kind of the more um, emergent one as well. And they're, just, they're variations on the same theme. It's a file format so that we can store our data in files, but with um, additional metadata that's going to give us those acid transactions. Well, and and so it's, because, those... it's because we're storing the stuff in files that gives us yeah. that that cross cloud compatibility, right? That allows us to yeah. move, move stuff around, right? And cross tool com- compatibility. So exactly that. So yeah, like you say, whether or not you're storing it in Google, or you're storing it in Amazon S3, or it's in um, Azure Data Lake, it's just a file. So somebody once said to me the fact, well, databases at the end of the day, that's just all files as well. 
which is true, but they're just a bit a little bit more proprietary and locked away. And like when we look at tables and databases, it's, yeah, it's an abstraction on top of some files, but it's not like you can really dig into those files and query them to your your heart's content. You can't this go very browse a, into that those files on with other tools. It's you're using yeah, SQL. Exactly. You're, you know, it's and yeah, yep, yeah. Lake House gives you that. Here's some files stored. Like you say, query them with uh, Databricks, query them with Synapse Serverless, query them with Dremio. I don't know how many people have come across Dremio, but that's like an open source um, like Lake House tool as well. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's any other vendors out there that, that come to mind, but yeah, you can you can get yourself in there. So this is where we land basically in terms of the Lake House. We, we no longer have to have, so the storage and the compute is still separated, but it's, at the same time, it's a little bit more integrated because we can use the same storage and compute for both types of workloads. So you, you could separate this out. You could say, I want to run, learn, run my machine learning with Databricks, and I want to use my uh, Synapse serverless for my BI analytics loads. But ultimately, you can still build it all into one platform and have, have it unified, whilst at the same time having that flexibility to sort of say, yeah, actually, Databricks, don't want to use that for my uh, compute anymore. Let's plug something else in. Okay, hang on before you before you click on anything. Uh, we have two questions from users, and I have an observation that I'd like to hit on here. Uh, uh, first, my observation is uh, thank you so much, Johnny Winters, uh, for using raw, base, and curated, or any other <laughs> names other than uh, Databricks' god awful naming standards, where they recommend bronze, silver, and gold. They, so you, you told me you told me not to click, Chris, but I'm just gonna have one click. Ah, <laughs> ah, so I <hate> but, <laughs> but but this comes from exactly the same place. So we um, at Advanced Analytics, we don't call it bronze silver gold. Okay. We like to use things that are more descriptive. Yes. But because bronze silver gold has become so recognized in the industry so we, we we don't we call it raw base and we call it curated we sometimes adapt that for our customers so i've got a customer i work with at the moment they call it raw standard and warehouse sure. that's how they want that's how they want to describe it but yeah bronze silver gold uh, bronze is supposed to be your dirty raw data but silver and gold aren't necessarily one better than the other they're just for different workloads you know silver's cleaned gold is cleaned and aggregated or and modeled um, that's the other right. thing. And, and frankly, I Made think click. many times in many places, the bronze may contain the most gold and value that you, you might have inside your Dow Lake. You just don't know it. Right. Um, and, and so I, oh, I just, I, I dislike that. Uh, this is like, I, I, I l I'll take any other naming convention. I use a slightly different one, but I'm not going to go into that because it doesn't matter. Right. Like, Yours is equally as good versus compared to bronze, silver, gold. Um, uh, so on that. So quick two questions from viewers. Um, uh, we, we had one question from uh, Christian. He asked, what are the best tools uh, when it comes to navigating and reviewing a data lake, data swamp? Is there, is there something like a hovercraft, he asks? Oh, so we're talking for an existing lake that's become a bit of a mess already, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ah, uh, do, do you know what? I'm I'm so late to the party that I've 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 never had to. So my my lake experience, having resisted for so long when I was in my earlier career because I just didn't like it. Um, most of my lake experience now has been part of lake house implementations, and okay. we put a lot more thought we put a lot more thought into our structure so so that we avoid that. Um, that swamp, um, that swamp scenario. Now, if I was browsing, if I wasn't a browse data, um, I would. And this is best tools. It's going to be there's going to be some kind of decisions you're going to make in terms of vendors and things like that. So, Snap Serverless. I'm pretty certain you can just um, you can uh, mount it to a you have it mounted to a lake. You can use external tables. You should be able to browse effectively folders of files as if they're tables in. Um, Synapse serverless. I tend to use uh, Databricks SQL because that's I'm just in a Databricks world. Um, and actually, I mentioned Dremio before. So actually, I used used to use Dremio in a pre a prior role. It wasn't much on wasn't so much on lakes or lake houses. We actually used to use it to 
consolidate um, different SQL sources. And we, it was only ever for exploration we used it. We didn't even actually use it as our kind of enterprise tool or our entry point for our analysts. It was just a, I had a desktop version. And so for that kind of ad hoc analysis, that can work as well. The, I don't know if it's still there. There was a Dremio community edition that you could download and, and mm. play about with, um, which which might be a, a good idea. But so I'm like, where's we need Kev Arnold and the It Depends jar, don't we? Like, there's, my, <laughs> there's, there's my dollar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent point. And you're exactly right. I, today, I don't think there is one tool that is necessarily the best. There's a lot of them that are competing and doing fairly well in this space. But yeah, I don't know if there's one best tool for that. Uh, and then last question before we continue on, uh, Kevin asks, and I have an opinion on this too, but I want to see what you, where you take this, Johnny. Um, Kevin asks, is there considered a best practice to store all possible data inside the data lake, or uh, is that what creates a data swamp? I think that you should always be intentional in terms of what you're storing. I think that is the the way to make sure you don't have a data swamp so that you you know what you're storing. You're not grabbing everything and throwing it in there, for want of a better term, willy-nilly. That sounded very British. <laughs> um, so I think you should always be intentional. I think this idea of, like, so again, putting my Power BI hat on and this idea of keeping my model really, really, really lean and only ever bringing in the things that I need I think in um, data lakes and lake houses, there's more of an argument for bringing more through. So definitely um, when I tend to bring a table into my raw layer, I'll bring through whole tables and I'll bring through every single column. Um, and some of those columns may have no value at this point in time. And possibly as we move through our lake layers and we sort of say, right, we've landed it into raw. Now we're going to clean that up and and have a version of this data in base, then those columns that have never ever been used and have got zero value may get left behind and I won't bring those into my um, my base um, part of my lake. So um, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question quite uh, with that, but kind of be intentional, like know what you're bringing through because you want to be able to, even in that raw layer, you want to be able to structure which tables and what sources they're coming from and know the origins of all the data. But in terms of um, you know bringing bringing more than you might need, but <laughs> thanks, Chris. <laughs> then uh, then uh, yeah, that's kind of almost one of the the the, the ideas with it. Almost the fact that you kind of have that sort of you know more more than you would have brought into a data warehouse traditionally. We used to transform our data warehouse. Uh, we used to stage things that had been sort of transformed before they hit stage to an extent as well. Whereas this is bringing it through during a much uh, more raw state and being able to go back. So, um, some of them. Go on. Oh, bef before we move on, and I want to like put a, a a cap on on this answer so Kevin can know. Uh, my contention is that every file on your network should be considered part of your raw space, and that is that's inclusive of every desktop, every laptop, every uh, OneDrive folder. Uh, every place where data exists should be considered a, a subset of your raw that just has not been mapped into raw yet. So uh, that is is my position. It should be separated off as like a swamp area, potentially. Like you've got your defined, processed, managed raw area, but then you have your your swamp you know area that is your raw space. So. That's my contention and the way I think it, the way I think of it, because the amount of data that exists inside of organizations and companies uh, is is far larger than we as data professionals typically consider. Uh, and I think we need to be expanding our view of data to be everything that may be out there, good and bad. I think another sort of point to that is that, again, going back to Databricks being marketeers and this bronze, silver, gold idea, that ends up being almost a bit of a constraint that people think they need to have bronze, silver, gold. And then I've heard people being like, oh, well, we're going to have platinum as well that's going to be a stage beyond gold. But actually, in a lot of the lake houses we implement, we have more than three layers. We're like We've had some implementations where we've had a, land, a landing layer. And so what, in our raw layer, we tend to still 
uh, convert everything to be delta format. But quite often we'll have a landing layer that sits before RAW that is completely un untouched. So if you're getting JSON files or CSV files, it's absolutely completely like unadul unadulterated RAW data um, versus that still, other than the fact we changed the format, um, we can we'll then convert it to delta. Um, and also we end up sometimes getting layers in between our base uh, layer and our curated layer. We have an enriched layer where it might, so mm. whereas our base layer tends to be um, raw data that's been cleaned, and then our um, curated layer is where we still do, it's like a data, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a data warehouse, but on different technology. So we still tend to use um, like Kimball principles and dimensional modeling. But sometimes it's good to have something that sits in between where you might actually want to um, mash up a couple of different data sources and, and do that before you actually aggregate it into that data warehouse layer as well. So by kind of straying away from that bronze, silver, gold um, naming convention, you can open it up to having like lots of different layers. And I, I actually went to a really, really good talk uh, last year at SQL Bits, a guy called Luke Mahoney, who works for Microsoft in this space. And he sort of said that it's still it's still a bit of an emerging practice. So I think lake houses, personally, I think that lake houses are here to stay. Best practices are still a little bit fluid, and he sort of said that like don't be constrained by exactly what Databricks say or exactly what Johnny says um, or what advancing what advancing analytics say. It's all about using the technology to f to meet whatever your requirements are and doing it your way. Um, so so yeah, even this this little um, diagram here. As I say, this kind of tried to, was trying to capture the fact that we have this curated layer and we still we still use dimensional, for our implementations, we still use dimensional modeling principles. Um, heard of people who um, like to have a data vault layer as well. Um, I've gotten to the point now where we've had um, a serving layer that sat out uh, beyond curated, whereby we've taken our curated layer might still actually be quite wide in terms of the attributes that we bring in and then we'll slim that down for something like a power bi uh, implementation so again in my curated layer i might have like audit columns like inserted dates and updated dates and i might have uh primary keys on my fact tables for argument's sake and i don't want any of that for analytics uses so sometimes we have a layer on top of that as well that kind of abstracts that curated layer even further so there's the, Right. So there's no right and wrongs. There yeah, probably I, are wrongs, but I, I, there's not. No, there's not necessarily one right. Right, I, and, and to build on that, I, I think you have to look at what your needs are of your organization. Right? Do you need that enriched layer where people are potentially uh, doing right back? Right? You know what? The, those numbers aren't exactly right. They're an amalgam of 14 systems, so you, changing any one of them won't give yield the right. You know right results that it needs to be so you know we're going to do some right cape right back capabilities well you can you can force it into the structure or you can create another layer that that takes that into account same thing with like api layers like you were talking about like an api has to be down dirty and and, and fast and scalable right you have to be able to handle a million hits a second well you don't want your data warehouse taking a million hits a second and you know, if your your tables are too wide and or too deep to get that stuff, it's that's not going to work either. So, yeah, it's very yeah. situational. We have to like still, there's still work here, right? Uh, we still have to do the job of going through it and building these things in place and managing them. So, excellent. Keep going now. No worries. Uh, in terms of history of the platform, this is kind of it. This is where we got to. We've got one, one set of one sort of unified platform and, and, and set of technologies that you can still mix and match. You've still got a separation of storage and compute, and you can make it almost modular, but it's still unified in terms of making sure that we're pushing through both our uh, business intelligence and analytics workloads and our, our data science workloads through that as well. It still sticks to, you know, tried and tested data warehouse and type principles as well. And it just becomes almost like the, the one-stop shop for everything. Um, that's kind of where I got to in terms of like that brief history. Um, I think there's a few good talking points. So we said we'd stick a pin in that. Um, what's the right size for organisations that want to want to use this? 
quite interesting, I guess, because um, from a uh, so this is, this is like this is a true life story working for um, a consultancy before I worked for Advanced Analytics and um, Advanced Analytics. We work with some some really big big clients. I think I mentioned before I've been working with uh, Hershey recently. Um, the consultancy I worked for previously was smaller, and our clients were small medium enterprises and they, they, they weren't so big and we had this thing where it was like does it make sense to implement a lake house for businesses that are this size because it just feel like a bit a bit overkill really because they don't really have the volume of data and um, you know should, should we should we go down the route and we did a bit of experimentation with it and we kind of found that from a a cost perspective it was neither here nor there so like if you can imagine we were doing quite small scale BI implementations and we used to use um, Azure SQL database, which is kind of like, you know, we weren't using SQL warehouse or Synapse dedicated. We were using um, Azure SQL database. And that, that's that's an always on resource in Azure. You can't switch it off. You can play about with scaling it to possibly save costs, but it's got to be always switched on. Um, whereas with a lake house pattern, you need to store your data in the lake, but lake storage is cheap. But from a compute perspective, you just you use what you need. It doesn't have to be, it can just be off and completely line dormant when it's not getting utilized. So we ran a few different experiments, and we kind of found that at the, at the lower end of the volume scale, from a price perspective and from a performance perspective, it was it was pretty much the same. It was there wasn't really much difference, you know. Um, again, it falls into it depends if they had. Um, data savvy people that were going to be um, querying the data on a regular basis and doing um, analysis using SQL queries, then potentially a database might be better for them because even though it's always on, actually, if they're using it a lot, that's fine. If they're using something like a Power BI self-service model, where basically you're landing it into your warehouse and then loading it into Power BI, well, after you've loaded it into Power BI, your warehouse still had to stay on, whereas your compute in the lake house scenario didn't. So it worked really, really well for them. And what we kind of sort of came to the conclusion with was that if we, even at a small scale, if we go with Lake House, it, it's still scalable later. It's still actually, you know, if, if here and now, if you're a large organization with loads and loads and loads of data, Lake House is probably starting to emerge as the de facto architecture that you like to go for. If you're much smaller, um, your volumes of data are of low, your use cases don't really, you don't really have any data science use cases. Fitting that all into, you know, something like Azure SQL database, or maybe even going, you know, Postgres on um, on an EC2 or something like that, that will probably work for your workloads. But what happens if the product you've, what happens if your product goes viral? And in six months' time, all of a sudden, whoa, we've we've hit the big time here. We've gone from a thousand customers a week to a million customers a week. Um Lake House architecture is gonna allow you to scale quickly. So it kind of gives you that future proofing. Um that's uh, effectively and, where we where that's where we landed with it. So, and, and and Johnny, to, to build on that, that's exactly why I say if if you have a hundred people or more in your shop, you should be really looking at uh, going the lake house pattern. Because the number of businesses that fail because they're unable to scale appropriately to meet their customers' needs is is staggering, right? It, it, they they get capped at a certain size, and because they can't adjust their tech, they can't adjust their resources, they can't adjust. They can never get above it, and that can actually lead to the like businesses you know going under because they get the sudden demand that they can't meet, and then they have huge problems. So that's why, and yeah. uh, Kevin, a dollar went in the jar. So uh, we, we have another depends, but I think that depend that the, you know what you should be doing. The recommendation on if you should be going lake house or not is coming way, way down uh, to the point where, I, I mean, honestly, soon it's going to pass into that hundred dollar or even below a hundred users. Just say, you know what, just go with the lake house architecture. Even if you don't need the data science stuff today, someday you may, and someday you may want to look back upon that raw data that you had today to help you understand what's going on in the future. And if you start to adopt it now, 
10 years from now, you could say, I've got 10 years of history in my, in my raw layer, my data lake house versus, well, I've got the last six months of aggregated data or whatever it is you happen to have captured inside of your, your data warehouse. So excellent. It's here, I do think it's here to stay, but probably in 10 years time, we'll probably be talking about data aquariums or <laughs> data bird houses or something like that. Who knows? And I, I, I think, yeah, I just think it gives you the flexibility for different workloads, different scenarios, scalability, and uh, yeah, portability as well, uh, you know, in terms of like shifting things around. So yeah, I think it's here. I guess there's, there's a couple of the things that I, I was I was going to mention, like when I was talking about the um, misconceptions, I came across some guy who was basically arguing that our oh, lake houses will never replace databases. And I was like, yeah, databases are still a thing. That's fine. We're talking specifically for analytics workloads here. You know, we're not, we're not looking to replace OLTP systems and, and, and transactional systems at all. This isn't what this is about. This is all analytics workloads, so data science and BI workloads effectively. So that was a bit moot. Um, I think the other sort of interesting discussion to get into is uh, I think one of the benefits of SQL is we talked about familiar, familiarity and the fact that SQL has been around forever. And I think some of the reluctance with Lake House is potentially around the skills gap because there's SQL engineers are 10 a penny, but Spark engineers, because Spark is ultimately the, uh, well, for Databricks and for Synapse, really, that's the the engine that a lot of it's built on. And Spark engineers aren't, aren't as, as common and like they can potentially be quite expensive. Um, I think for me, that becomes an education piece that like, the more people that can become familiar and comfortable with the technology, that's going to drive the market down in terms of we're going to have more people. So the fact that there's only, I don't know, a dozen good Spark engineers in the world, well, that's obviously a silly number. That's not what I mean. But, you know, okay, let's have hundreds of them. It's way then, too you know, large. It's much smaller. Than that. <laughs> yeah. So I think... Like, I met yeah, the three it's... guys that one time. They were... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think, you know... Personally, I, I like the idea of trying to embrace the change and, and roll with it and, and 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 learning about all this stuff as opposed to sort of fearing it because it's different to what we've done for for pushing 30 years. Well, and, and so to build on that, we're basically, when we talk about a lake house, we're talking about a structure that combines a data lake where we've got distributed files that are out there so that data scientists can work and operate. But we also have still have our data warehouse that's just, part of that lake house, leveraging similar technologies, similar concepts, but pulling forward and pulling in all of the, the things that the you know data lake never had in the past and, and putting it into the same platform, right? So that you kind of have the best of both worlds in a scalable solution that you know, is, is cloud agnostic. I mean, we're talking, you know, we've talked about snaps, we've talked about databricks, but you know, you've also talked about uh, GCP and Snowflake and these other tools that are out there, right? So this, this is a great pattern to start to develop um, because you can really flip around and try different things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and uh, what, what, what do we say? Uh, uh, so when the data aquarium, it does become the standard and you need your data goldfish uh, as as your, your 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 big tool and the bubbler for for oxygen oxygenating your 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 aquarium, you'll be able to do that with the same data files. There won't be a big conversion at that time, right? Exactly. Like when you in your goldfish layer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was good. Uh, <laughs> that was impressive. Well done, sir. All right. Uh, well, we are getting near time. Uh, uh, I wanted to, you know, before we go, I, I just do want to do a quick little um, uh, a promo for next week. I've got Bernat. He's going to be joining us next week. He's going to be going deep into Power BI parameters. I think he mentioned something about calculate columns too. So uh, do join in uh, on that session. I'm really looking forward to, to speaking with him. We're going to do a similar like Q&A. This is something we're, we're going to be doing every single week. Uh, normally Wednesdays at noon, but we have, uh, I've got a, a special event that's about to come up, uh, more on that. Once it gets announced, I can't wait to show you guys, uh, what we have coming up, but I know what it is. 
Yeah, I, <laughs> thank you. And, uh, thank you for being flexible to, to, to cover that. So cheers, uh, Johnny. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Really appreciate you coming out. Really appreciate you asking us questions and and uh, you know being part of the community. Really enjoy connecting with each and every one of you. Johnny, do you have anything, parting words? Uh, go Lake House. It's the future. Go with it. But yeah. thanks very much for having me on as well, Chris. It's been a pleasure. Oh, yeah. Always happy to, to actually, I think this is like the first time we've been able to like communicate and talk. And so that's great. I've, I'm a big fan of your stuff. So excited to be able to work with you more closely. So this is awesome. Feeling, feelings mutual. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you guys all very much. You guys have a great day. Peace. Tilly Digital combines strategic industry insight and advanced technical expertise to uncover and solve your digital transformation challenges. If you're interested in learning more, check out our website at bakertilly.com digital.